Um, I'd like to welcome everyone to the Advances in Qualitative Data Analysis session. My name is Kelly Feenan. I am the uh, rapporteur for this session, and I'm very pleased that the Office of Eva Eva Evaluation has asked me to participate. I'm uh, an EFAT staff member. I'm in the IT department. I'm the change administrator. I'm the change management administrator. I'm very, very happy to introduce Dr. Stuart Schulman. Dr. Schulman is a research associate and uh, research associate professor of political science at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. And he's also the founding director for the Qualitative Data Analysis Program at the University of Pittsburgh. In addition, Dr. Schulman is the inventor of the Coding Analysis Toolkit and uh, is an open, open source web-based text analysis software project. And he is also the founder and chief executive officer of Textfer, which is a, histor a historical Twitter sifter tool. So I'd like to welcome Dr. Schulman, and I'm very happy to turn the floor over to him at this time. Thank, thank you, Kelly. Just a few clarifications. It's, it's been a few years since I've been in the university. Yeah. I did leave mm -hmm. the university to start the company. Um, but thank you for, for reminding me of where this all comes from. The, they asked me to talk about changes in qualitative methods and software over time, which is easy for me to talk about, in part because it's just my story. So I'm going to largely tell you my story, uh, including um, a few things about my background, as well as the most important things I've learned about doing qualitative research and how the introduction of computers into qualitative research changed me and changed my understanding of text and of data and of methods, and then talk about some of the things that define our work right now around human collaboration and online labeling systems and the creation of training sets for machine learning, um, which are, are core to what I do. So first of all, let me just say a little bit about my background. Sometimes when you're a method person, you show up at conferences where you feel like you don't really fit because of what you've studied and how you've studied it, and it can feel a little awkward. So I just want to say that 25 years ago, I was a small holder. Actually, I was a squatter, and I had a certified organic farm in Eugene, Oregon. And when I realized after three years of being a farmer that I was making about 2 or $3 per hour for my work, which I loved, I went back to school to study political science, and in the first year, organized a conference on the politics of sustainable agriculture. So I do have some uh, ag ties in my background that I think are interesting, but other ones as well. Like when I started labeling text, it was books, not political data. They were books about politics, but in my undergraduate thesis, I read these books over and over again and identified archetypal characters within the book. I was underlining things with colored pens and coding them, but I didn't really know it was coding. No one had taught me coding or labeling or tagging. I was just discovering things inductively in the data. And this is what my dissertation data looks like. Lots of crumbly newspapers from the progressive era. I wrote about the origins of the Federal Farm Loan Act, which was how the government got into lending money to farmers in the United States with a piece of legislation in 1916, which was considered quite radical. Uh, I did, among other things, brought amortization from European credit markets into the United States for the first time which allows most Americans uh, to dream about owning a home now. Uh, and what I was doing back then was reading very closely lots of old, crumbling newspapers and identifying themes inductively from the data. Again, my, my training was in stats, econometrics, and applied econometrics as a political science PhD student. But the thing that I loved to do was to find passages of text that correspond with categories of interest. I was interested in you know, the rates and terms that farmers were paying for credit. And I discovered through a variety of techniques over a period of a couple of years that, in fact, farm profitability and a whole variety of things were being talked about, including farm loans, in the context of an early sustainable agriculture movement amongst railroad men, bankers, and others who were worried about the cost of food in the cities going up and up and up. And they saw better farming and better lending to farmers as a way to make sure that the cost of living would stay down. Now, did I go into this as a recent former organic farmer looking for a 1912 to 1916 sustainable agriculture movement run by business people? No, but because I used a method, traditional inductive qualitative method, I found things that I wasn't looking for. And this had a very profound effect on my way of thinking 
uh, for years to come. When I got out of grad school, I discovered that being an inductive qualitative researcher in the discipline of political science is not very favorable in the job market. And I was told to modernize my act if I wanted to be employed by some very trusted advisors. And I, I was lucky enough to stumble across a data set of public comments on the organic agriculture standard in the US. And the, uh, the USDA provided me those comments on a big zip disk, which back then was, I think, a 50 megabyte zip disk that people thought was big data. So definitely big data evolves. It was 20,000 comments. It was a big zip disk, which nobody even uses that technology anymore. But it started me into learning about software. Some professor I was working at Providence College reached onto his shelf, and he pulled a shrink-wrapped piece of software off of his uh, shelf and said, hey, why don't you try using this? We're all quantitative people. We've been afraid to open it. And back then, software used to come wrapped up in, in boxes, and you would install it on your computer, which is another big change to where we are now. So we started getting funding from the National Science Foundation to work with government agencies on the particular problem of what happens when too many people submit comments to the government on a proposed regulation, like the organic standard or mercury pollution, half a million emails, polar bear, endangered species, 660,000 public comments, one federal official responsible for sorting all those. So this was a research group devoted to dealing with the problem of too much information and also to collaboration between social scientists and computer scientists, government agencies and citizen groups to come up with a solution for a burgeoning problem, which was people were getting online and submitting comments and the government was required to read them under the laws of the United States. Okay, so that's the background that I bring to this talk. I'm going to slow down a little bit and talk a li uh, about these two slides about things that are, I think, discoveries of mine over the years, over the evolution from the guy with the colored pens to the guy with the software company, which, believe me, was a very unexpected and accidental evolution. So back when I was first learning about what qualitative methods were and learning the landscape within my discipline, one thing that was clear is that some people do qualitative because they don't like quantitative, right? And if, particularly in the United States in my discipline, the divide between quals and quants was at times uh, something close to a war. Uh, sides would not talk to each other, did not respect each other, did not work together, and there were certain people who were avoiding the other side because they just didn't like it or couldn't do it. Um, there's another group of people who I ran into who were very influential on me who were mixed methods people, people who were uh, non-denominational, if you will. They weren't going to take part in any warfare or ideological battle about methods. They were going to use anything that made their research better, and they would try anything, and they were very open-minded about that. I'm going to come back to that in a second. The one thing I can say that I think all folks share, although they will call it different things, right? Some people say credible. Other people say valid. They mean the same thing. Right? Uh, but they still might not talk to each other because you said credibility and I said validity. But this idea that your work should be replicable, that you should pay attention to the sources of error, um, that you should validate everything you do uh, internally and externally became very important in my own work. And another thing that came, especially when I was visiting universities and doing lectures and talking especially to qualitative groups was, some people believed that simply using software, or I guess ICTs would be the, the proper term here, would make research better. As if there was no obligation for the research to come up with a good question to, as Michael would say, bring theory to the table. You know, that there was somehow this magic bullet effect, and I thought the previous speaker was excellent, uh, made this similar point, which is you can't really expect magic to come out of software. You know, magic comes out of humans. Who, who create and implement effective research strategies. So over time, I came to understand qualitative research as a spectrum of approaches. I was trained way down on the right-hand side of this spectrum in a very quantitative discipline with a focus on deductive work, hypothesis testing, generalization, replication. But in my heart, I was way down at the other end. In my heart, I was very sympathetic to people who spend a lot of time with their data, so much time that they're almost uniquely qualified to say something about the data. And that's one of the claims in qualitative research is if you're not going to spend the time with the data to form that unique relationship to it, you can't really make substantive or credible claims about it. And the place that I ended up and the place I think all people should end up 
in terms of methods, is in that pluralist approach, right, where you're willing to embrace both ends of the, the spectrum and don't be afraid of numbers, even if they're not your strong suit. They're not my strong suit, right? But now I, I run a, a kind of software company and work with computer scientists and do a lot of counting and measurement and, and things like that because I found value in it. And don't give up on the things at the far left of the spectrum either because once you've used machines to take big piles of text and make smaller piles, there's still an irremovable role for the human to interpret what those small piles mean. So the call out and that people were here in the last section heard human in the loop, this is very much a credo that um, we live by in the work that I do. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the types of software that are out there and what they mean for the practice of qualitative uh, research. Uh, this book was one that I read very early in the journey. Uh, Fielding and Lee were sort of pioneers in the documentation and practice of qualitative research using software. They started a, a field of scholarly interest referred to as CACDAS, uh, Computer Assisted Qualitative Data Analysis Software, CACDAS. And I, I go back and look at this book periodically because it was really formative in my thinking and also in my current practice of how we operate um, in, our, in my company when we're doing research, which is that one of the best things you can do with software is accumulate as many relevant chunks of text about the thing you care about as possible, right? Accumulate, store, sort, organize the relevant text that helps you answer a question. It's really the first priority. And a lot of the work we do right now, you mentioned the historical, we support a lot of work on historical and real-time Twitter data. That is replete with problems about relevance, right? And I'll mention a few of them later in the talk. Uh, but finding relevant data within bigger available sets is really what um, the research process comes down to because to the extent that you get that funnel narrowed to the point where you're looking at every possible observation relevant to what you're studying, you're gonna find the research is gonna be more satisfying in the end. The big mistake a lot of qualitative researchers make, and others as well, I suppose, is trying to answer every question uh, that their data might be relevant to, rather than getting all the relevant data to a particular question. Uh, and that can apply in focus groups, that can apply in interviews, that can apply in social media or survey data as well. A couple of other books that had a huge impact on the practice of research, as I understand it, um, the What Will Google Do book by Jeff Jarvis is outstanding book. Uh, essentially, the takeaway for me was rather than building a thing that is valuable, build a platform on which other people can build value. And as, a, as now a software um, designer and a software builder, this has become a sort of principle. I'm not going to build the magic bullet that's going to solve your problems. I'm going to build a platform on which you can solve your problems and have hopefully the tools you need to be able to do that. Uh, the James Glick book is my favorite book of all time. Uh, and the history of information has been mentioned here many times, I think, today. Expanding amounts year on, year after year. Expanding amounts of data, unlike we've, what we've ever seen before. And what we really need are systems for filtering that data to make it accessible to do the things we want to do. Again, relevance. And then the Weinberger book is just outstanding as well. All his books are outstanding. His lectures are outstanding. He's a wonderful scholar. Uh, but basically, Weinberger argues that different people can label the same data for different reasons at different times, and all of those labels are valuable. You might not use them, but the fact that we can accumulate these labels in different systems, again, at different times for different reasons, is the power of the new digital disorder. So in terms of software, I started with a program called Nudist, which is not as sexy as it sounds. Non-numeric, unstructured data indexing, searching, and theory building. But I wanted to mention a few of the programs that are out there that was specifically in my charge for this talk. Um, so I've used all of these programs at one point or another. Uh, NVivo is sort of the later version uh, of Nudist. And one of the things that these uh, uh, systems have in common is a method called code and retrieve. I actually call it retrieve, code and retrieve because you've got to go and retrieve a chunk of text, highlight it, and grab a code or codes and label it, right? So there's this process of labeling the chunks of text the same way I was doing with pen and paper in my dissertation or even in my undergraduate thesis, but you're just using the um, computer software as a kind of filing cabinet. It's a good way to think about it. 
and you're creating different segments within your filing cabinet. So once you've retrieved, coded, and retrieved the data, you can go back and look at all the relevant examples around a particular theme. And so a lot of these programs look very similar. This is in vivo. You've got uh, data on the far right that needs to be coded. You've got a code list, right? And the user interacts with the data, highlights the passage of text, and pulls the codes over. If you look at in vivo or Atlas TI, they were sponsors of our lab for years. We used to teach Atlas workshops. Our first software was built to deal with the output of Atlas coding. Same thing, data, codes. One thing that you might notice on the screen like this is it can get a little bit messy, a little complicated. Some people love that. Some people are um, put off by that. I think both arguments are quite valid, that there are, there's something about this sort of style. Here's at MaxQDA, another sort of market-leading computer uh, off-the-shelf, commercial off-the-shelf qualitative software package where things get very busy very fast. Again, that works very well for some people. For other people, that busyness on the screen can become an impediment, in fact, even a detraction from, from using the software at all. And if you move away from traditional qualitative uh, data analysis software, sort of newer text analytics packages, what you start to see is a movement to incorporate more tools that use either automation or fully automated, unsupervised techniques, or things that, as was mentioned in the last session, can only be done by machines. It would be very difficult to be done by humans. You might even see the incorporation of machine learning, the building of uh, topic models, other things that are uh, either semi-supervised by humans or fully unsupervised. And so this is a, a good example of the kind of interface you might see if you moved into a text analytics uh, package where you were trying to take advantage of some of these power tools that can get you into bigger data sets. Uh, and here's a look at intensity, which is one of the leading commercial applications uh, where they've built models, uh, classifiers for different industries that can take data and can feed back sort of the distribution of elements within that data without a huge amount of work on the part of the human. Um, I wrote an article with one of my students back in, in 2008 um, that basically made a set of arguments that I, when I went back and read it in advance of coming here, I was like, boy, that, that one article really shaped my thinking for a long time to come. And so I've tried to, to summarize what the article says just so you can, you can see sort of what the, the debate is about amongst potential users of qualitative uh, software. So first of all, it, it is incredibly convenient. I mean, in terms of a filing cabinet, it's a very good filing cabinet, right? Qualitative data analysis software allows you to organize your data in a way that if it was all pen and paper would be very difficult and to get to parts of your data very quickly, right? So the convenience is important. You can, you can to a certain extent, um, auto code or search and build up bigger repositories of potentially relevant items. Um, using the software that again allow you to navigate sort of to the high level but back to that individual verbatim or the individual um, coded piece of text. In terms of keeping all of your memos and things that define the workflow, Cactus software is great. You're going to have all your memos, you're going to have memos about codes, you're going to have memos about pieces of text, you're going to have memos that are your daily work memos and when you need to go write your article or your evaluation report as this context would suggest, you've got all of the memos that you need to begin the writing process in a, a fully organized and accessible uh, place. There are also features within these software systems that might allow you to do things, again, very quickly, such as word frequencies or co-occurrence frequencies that give you a sense of the landscape of the data without av actually having to do much work. Um, and that is, for some people, very appealing. As we'll see in a second, for some people, that's a big problem as well. Um, Discovery of outliers. I mean, this has become a big part of what we do in my work, right? It's very easy to find the central tendencies in qualitative data. When you're looking at it and you're just interacting with it as a human does, you start to get a sense of what the major themes were. If an insurance company asks all of their customers, how did you feel about your claim? You know, 40% are going to say it's about the price and 40% are going to say it's about service and 10% are going to say it's about price and service. And all the insurance company wants to know is what do the other 10% think? because they already knew before they asked that price and service were the two common central tendencies in the answers to those questions. Um, so sometimes finding outliers is the most important thing you can do with software, even if what you're doing is using the software 
to first find the central tendency so you can set them aside and look at the remainder to see what's in there that you didn't expect. You might even think of that as an unexpected concept finder. You can bring uh, scale to bear. So when I got that first zip disk of 20,000 uh, public comments, it did seem like big data. Maybe it still is uh, big data. Now I have a billion records in my database, so maybe 20,000 doesn't seem like that much. But um, back then, 20,000 records was a lot and being able to go and find all the ones about genetic engineering, all the ones about sewage sludge, all the ones about um, uh, irradiation, which were the three big topics in that data, using essentially search terms were very valuable. And then another strong claim for software in the qualitative field is that ability to iterate very quickly, to build a model, to revise the model, to, to bring that new model to bear, and to test it and revise it and have it grow and evolve uh, over time. And finally, although not every qualitative researcher would do this, it does create at least the possibility for greater transparency in describing how you did what you did through those process memos, right, through those reflection papers that you write that become a part of how you report. You can be more transparent when you have a better record of, oh, I started with 15 codes, but then I cut it down to 10. Here's why I did that. You know, the, some were overlapping, whatever the case may be. There's all sorts of reasons to do that. Now, I want you to remember convenience, efficiency, organization, patterns, outlier, scale, iteration, transparency, because, and legitimacy, right, which gets back to that debate about how do you um, substantiate your claims, your inferences, based on the, 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 the work that you've done with the data. Um, because all of those things are the arguments about us against using software as well. It's the exact same things. When you create tools that allow people to avoid certain kinds of tedious or mundane work, some people would argue you've really undermined the pure essence of qualitative research and replaced it with something that is basically a shortcut that will lead you to invalid or false inferences. Uh, similarly, um, the fact that you can do a lot with a lot uh, may sort of undermine the fact that sometimes the most important things that you discover in qualitative research are rare. Um, they are, they, you know, maybe they happen once in a thousand records, uh, but it might be the most important thing in a thousand records, and there's no efficient way really to determine what that one super important observation from a nurse who works at the, you know, in the, in the pediatric ward or in some, in the geriatric ward, somebody who's got something that they alone have figured out, the tools aren't going to help you find that person or find that observation. It might actually sell you short on figuring out what those things are for the sake of efficiency. <clears throat> you, uh, you will find people um, spending days, weeks, months learning the software days, weeks, months, implementing the project within the software to the point that it seems like the purpose of the project is to operate the software. And that's not a good thing, because really the purpose of the project is to answer a research question. Um, patterns, similarly, can be very misleading. Right? Humans are drawn to patterns. Humans think patterns are great. We love it when we see a pattern. We love it when a machine helps us to see a pattern. But the pattern itself may mislead you down down a path of thinking that the pattern is significant when it may not be for a variety of reasons. Um, again, outliers, a, a quali the qualitative purist in me would say that that one person who makes the best comment is more important than the 10,000 people who make an average comment. And, and somehow the software can both help you but also sell you short for getting to that point. Uh, a lot of talk about big data earlier. I actually tend to think that um, you know, big data is a very poorly used, misunderstood term. Most people have medium data, not big data. Uh, they've got a thousand responses to a survey. They've got, you know, something in the nature of 10,000 observations. Big data is billions of records, trillions of cells. All right, so most of us are working on medium data and calling it, and calling it big data. But um, data does not need to be big to be good plenty of good data that is very, very small or medium, and it can be misleading to think, oh, the software lets me get to big data, therefore my research will be better. It won't, necessarily. Um, one of the particular critiques of the qualitative data analysis software is that when they were built, they created pathways, sort of structured pathways. They're flexible, but structured pathways that guided people down certain avenues. 
the co-occurrence explorer exists. I better go look at it. I better go see what the co-occurrences are. Oh, there's all these co-occurrences. Those must be significant. I better go look at them. Um, there's a certain critique of the qualitative data analysis software that says it's too heavily in indebted to inductive grounded theory uh, and that it's built up essentially as a mechanical instantiation of a particular theory about how to move from data to inference and that it, it sort of circumvents or short circuits a more pure, uh, purely mixed deductive inductive uh, model. And then uh, some of the features, especially in, the, in, in, the, in, in automated topic models, or uh, various other features that you'll find in software, both the text analytics and the traditional, you don't always know how they work. And the user may be using the feature without understanding what the underlying principles are that produce the results. Uh, and finally, and this is the po point I started with, your research cannot be better because it has software. Your research can be better because you have a better uh, question, that you've refined a better method, not because you've brought some technology to bear on that. Okay, so that's a mouthful. Part four, uh, talk a little bit about, um, and very quickly, my history uh, I work on collaboration uh, tools. We used to use Atlas TI in our lab. Everybody had to have a software license. Uh, we had to install it on different computers. We had to take uh, specialized records off different computers and merge them together. And ev eventually the whole thing was, was not getting us where we needed to be, especially as we started to work with computer scientists. We needed to be able to do, do things like measure inter-rater reliability and deal with differences between uh, coder observation. So we got into the business of building free, open source, web-based software in 2007. I'm happy to say this is still running uh, 10 years later, though we don't um, do much to maintain it. I'm still working with the engineer who helped build this original coding analysis uh, toolkit and what CAT did is on the one hand it allowed us to take the work of multiple users of Atlas TI and merge their work together and and see the inter-rater reliability and deal with the differences that was really the original goal but then it became a coding platform when we realized that the, the builders of Atlas TI were not going to put in things that I wanted like the ability to have an item load to the screen and just hit a keystroke oh that's a one that's a two that's a one that's a three that's a one that's a one that's a one Right, so we had to build our own software so that we could speed up the process both of recording observations and of doing the kind of measurements and adjudication around those observations that were important. And the reason we had to build this software, and this is really one of the, I think, most important slides um, in the deck, right? Because it's based on this, this idea that the creation of categories is in itself problematic. Some categories have very hard boundaries. Some categories have very soft boundaries. Right? Hard might be relevance, somewhat softer might be topic, and very soft might be something like sentiment. Right? And these present unique challenges. And the best way I've found to describe this to people is, if you put 100 people in a room and ask them to label 100 tweets, relevant, not relevant, or topic A, topic B, topic C, the 100 people will not agree. Right? And in fact, if you ask the same, you know, they'll, they'll agree on some, they'll disagree on others. This is a fundamental problem of creating training sets for machine learning. If you ask them a week later to label the same hundred items, they will often not agree with themselves. You become a different person. The more time you spend with data, the different the landscape of the data appears. You know, you've got a hundred items and you're 50 items in and you suddenly realize the first 15 items were all wrong, right? This is the natural ebb and flow of human understanding. So software doesn't make that problem go away. Right? All software can do is bring to the surface the fact that the problem exists and that different humans have different levels of aptitude for dealing with the challenge. And no one human is good at all challenges. Someone might be good at most and terrible at another, and I'll give you an example in a minute. This is a wonderful paper that when it came out in 2013, Grimmer and Stewart, um, it summarized the last 13 years of my life so precisely I almost let out a hallelujah because it is a problem to label lots of items, to organize the group, to do things at scale. It's difficult to validate some models. Some models are easier to validate than mo other models, and all models are wrong at some point. And what that means is at some point, you're gonna look at a piece of data and it's gonna break your model. And then what do you do? Right, and this is where we get into the iteration and, and validation piece. And what I really liked about this is whether or not you're relying on humans or machines, the key is to validate, validate, validate. Doesn't really matter whether it's human learning or machine learning or both. 
the, the rapid iteration of validation steps is, is really important. And particularly when you're starting to use to techniques like crowdsourcing, right, where you may or may not know the people who are labeling your data. As you move to bigger and bigger data sets, you may be tempted to bring more people into the group who are doing the label. Even right now, I'm working with a group of about 20 federal agency personnel. We're re reviewing uh, 100,000 plus public comments about the status of national monuments in, in, in the US. And the uh, task simply, is there new information in this comment or not? Well, you'd be amazed at how different people approach the concept of is there something new or unique in this comment? Different people will see things different ways. So crowdsourcing is great because in part you can get through things very quickly, you can get diverse perspectives, but you can also get a wide variety of aptitudes for a particular task. And it's important not to pretend that all humans are created equal. I'm sorry, that sounds awful and anti uh, democratic, but it's true, and I'll say it again. It's important not to believe that all humans are created equal in this task, because they are not. Uh, it is an inescapable fact that for every task, there is a small number of people who are very good at it. There's a somewhat bigger percentage who are very bad at it. And there is everybody else who is normal or average at it, meaning they might make mistakes uh, one out of four or one out of five times, meaning that somewhere between a quarter and a fifth of all their average observations are false positives or false negatives. So you've got to at least acknowledge that this is a fact, I think, in the modern world, if you're going to em embrace software and machine learning. And that's part of what came out of my work for years with about 10 years of funded research by the National Science Foundation, collaborating with these computer scientists. And for them, their bread and butter is measurement, right? Whereas some of those purest qualitative researchers may be repelled by the idea of me measurement. But we embraced it, we built it into our software, and we believe it's absolutely fundamental to doing um, good machine learning. So one of the first things we built was just a very simple tool for comparing the work of multiple annotators when they label the same items. We use a measure called Fleiss's Kappa, which tells you the level of agreement beyond chance. And the goal is, of course, if you're training machines to get to a higher level of inter-rater reliability as high as possible. Um, now, for some tasks, those hard bounded tasks, you can get pretty high levels of inter-rater reliability. You can get up to 0 0.9, 0 0.95. You can have people agreeing that yes, this categorization is correct. But for more subtle things, topics, especially when they're numerous, emotions or sentiment, the, the task of getting humans to agree, is this a positive or negative comment, is almost mind boggling at times. And the differential abilities across, excuse me, across um, coders are quite pronounced. The other thing that we built early on in our software development, and I think it's probably the most important thing we ever did, was a method for adjudicating differences between coders. Right? So in the coding analysis toolkit, we built this adjudication module. In this example, five annotators have labeled this Chinese microblog post as, uh, uh, as to whether or not it's about the shoot down of an airplane, MH17. Four of them have agreed that it is, and one has argued that it is not. And through the process of adjudication, what we do is we go through and we decide either as an expert or through a consensus process who was right and who was wrong. Sometimes the four are wrong, and the one is right. The one will see something, the one exceptional coder will see something that the other four miss. More commonly, the four are right and the one is wrong. In this case, the first four characters are the English characters MH17, so we would say probably that in this case, coder 2279 was wrong and all the rest were right. But this is how we label data and then do a second level of annotation to adjudicate differences between coders. And um, it was the, ba the things we learned through this process were the basis of a patent that was awarded last year that the colloquialism is coder rank. Essentially what we said is that not all coders are created equal. Some are very good. Some are poor and most are average. And that if you want to do machine learning, it's better to weight the observations of the annotators who are more likely to make a valid observation. It's not rocket science, but somehow nobody had taken it to the patent office before. It's sort of analogous to the way that Google looks at the web and says not all web pages are equal. New York Times is more powerful than Stu's blog. And we're going to weight the New York Times links more heavily than links on Stu's blog. All I'm doing is saying not all humans are equal. 
when we go to li- when we go to train machines, we want to lean more heavily on the humans in the loop, most likely to create a valid observation. And it, through this process of iteration and the discovery of sort of who's getting it and who's not, or how hard is the problem, or how easy is the problem, we start to learn more about not just the individual human over time, but also about the problem of labeling data, which is an inescapable problem to anybody using software. Uh, Final piece here, or second to last, human and machine learning. Um, What I've been describing, uh, even when I was talking about my undergrad thesis with the books and the colored pens or the old crumbly newspapers, is commonly known as labeling, tagging, annotation. And the more of it you do, uh, the more quality labeling you do, the better your machine learning is going to be. There's a point after which more labeling makes no sense, where the return from more labeling is not better machine learning. Um, what, we, what we have built is a system that makes that rapid iteration between the human labeling, the measurements, the adjudication, the machine learning, and then the subsequent filtering of data based, based on machine learning, then sampling, then feeding a sample back to the laborers, uh, uh, the coders, is that you can build custom machine classifiers very quickly. And you don't need to be a computer scientist. You don't need to have a mathematical background. You don't need to write Python or run a server or anything like that. You just really need to understand this fundamental point, which is if the humans can label it, the machines can probably pick up the task. Now, I know there are other approaches um, that don't involve humans as intimately. Uh, that are also very interesting for generating models of data. But this is our model, which is rapid iteration in the creation of custom machine classifiers. And a particular feature of that is that the fewer the number of categories, the closer to binary choice that you get, the easier it is to build a classifier. Right? So we typically don't build code sets that are 10 or 20 or 30 categories. We typically build code sets that are two or three categories. And then we use splitting features to get to more granular or finer grained uh, approaches. One of the most common uses, again, is relevance, or in in our social media work, word sense disambiguation. When we had 100 million tweets collected that had the verb smoking in them, we had to distinguish between people who were talking about smoking tobacco, which is what the object of the study was, and people who are smoking weed, who are much more numerous on Twitter, uh, people who are smoking barbecue, and all the smoking hot boys and smoking hot girls, which was pornography. And what we found is that this problem is ubiquitous in social media analytics and in some other text analytics as well, right? Which is that you may have a brand name like Avon that corresponds with the name of 14 towns in the United States, a TV character who's super popular still from The Wire, Avon Barksdale, and that guy in the bottom right-hand corner is Justin Bieber when he was young, playing on the steps of the Avon Theater. If I want to go into Avon and talk to them about all the relevant social media data talking about Avon, I've got to build a machine classifier that can get rid of everything that's not about the the cosmetics company. And you can do that. Anybody can do that. We did a project recently on the Super Bowl. The Patriots were in, collected a million tweets that mentioned Patriots the week of the Super Bowl. Turned out there's a very virulent strain of Patriots in the US who are talking about like getting your guns and getting armed and preparing for the, the upcoming war which apparently, according to them, is going to be a race war. Um, Those are patriots now in the United States. Um, So if you want to do analytics on football, you've got to get rid of the politics, or vice versa, if the word is ambiguous. So uh, what do we do with these human train sets and the machine learning we do? We then label uncoded items on the likelihood that they fall into a particular category. So this is a sample distribution of, of where a a, a data set of uncoded items lie in terms of the statistical probability that they are in a particular category. And then you can use that machine-generated score, which is derived from human training data, as a filter. Right? I might say, okay, show me everything tobacco above 0.85. I'll take a sample out of that, and I'll give it back to the coders. Right? And one, I sort of iterate this loop until I get to the point where I see that adding more human labeling will not improve the quality of the machine classification. Is the machine ever going to get it all right? No. But the flawed assumption that a lot of people bring is that the human always will. No. (laughs) Humans make tons of mistakes. Humans are mistake-making machines. I mean, they're unbelievable how bad they are. And they have to sort of face up to it and admit, some of us are just not very good at this. 
the assumption that most people use is that if the human is doing it, we're just trying to get the machine as close to the ideal human as possible. Well, that's not really a thing because there is no ideal human, right? It, depending on the task, depending on the group of humans in the room, you're trying to get close to which human or which humans or which ideal, which gold standard. Final thing I'll say is there are some things that we do, uh, this is clustering, for example, that don't involve humans, where we just take data and we throw it in and we cluster things that are similar together just by looking at every two-word combination, every biogram in a collection, and comparing it to every other two-word combination in the collection and doing a measure of difference across documents. No human involvement, just an algorithm. Is it an end product of research? No. Is it a stepping stone or a pathway into the data? Definitely. Will it prompt you to think differently or act differently about the data? For sure. So uh, that's where we've come from pen and paper to uh, automatically formed clusters and machine learning. It's um, something that I think we all are going to do. We're all doing in some forms, you know, when you, when you label a piece of junk mail in your email, you're training a machine, right? When you select a, a movie on Netflix or a product on Amazon, you're training a machine. Uh, we're all doing it at some level, and to the extent that we can do it and bring value to our research, I think it's important work. Uh, so just to summarize what um, our work has been over the years, CAT is our free open source um, software. It encourages you to either run a copy of the code on your own servers or use our web-based uh, service. It's actually more popular than our commercial software, which is surprising to me because it's so much older and has so many fewer features. Oh, free, that's right. That's Yeah, okay. Good point, good point. Uh, we've put these tools on the web, which I think is an important advantage over traditional software that you install on a particular computer or multiple computers, especially for those of us who like to work at the office and work at home. Web-based software has advantages also for the crowdsourcing. Um, we've tried to innovate a little bit around the margins of, of, of measurement, particularly around this idea of ranking coders over time. Um, we are and deeply involved. I was at Boulder this week at the big Twitter event, big Boulder, uh, providing access to free and, and premium Twitter data. Some of these features that we've built into the software have come from users' requests. I wish I could do this. I wish I could do that. So we're always looking for more users who have more requests, not because we can have a huge team that can build this stuff overnight. We don't. We're, we're two people and only one of us is a, an engineer. Uh, so we're a small, a small operation, but we've stuck around building tools like duplicate detection, machine learning, word sense di disambiguation, because we think and believe they make research better. Uh, so thank you. Okay, so we have about 15 minutes for questions for Dr. Schulman. I think because of the size of the room, what I'd like to do is take one question at a time. That way it will give um, the, the, our, our little microphone people um, time to get to the question. So for the first question, who has a question for Dr. Schulman? Of course, it's the guy on the far side of the room. <laughs> but the next one's coming from over here. Prediction, yes. flawed human prediction. Thank you. Should have gotten your roller skates. Yeah. <laughs> Dr. Shulman, thank you very much for a wonderful presentation. It was extremely interesting. Yeah. Uh, my name is Thomas McMahon. I'm an evaluation officer with the IAEA. Um, a couple of questions for you. Um, just on the classifications of the text coding itself. Yeah. Do you recommend a type of entropy information gain approach to the actual labels themselves and make that an iterative process? Or do you prefer to go all the way through iterations and then just see you're testing your, uh, your training data against your holdout and see what the result is? I, I bet I'm not the only one in the room who wouldn't mind having a term defined. Uh, okay, so splitting your data? Yeah, sorry, you yeah, go ahead, sorry. doctor. Anything with entropy in it tends to make people's heads spin. Okay, sorry about that. I'll just say in like layman's language what you mean. Okay, uh, <laughs> um, choosing the, the coding categories, let's say, yes. that you're splitting Beautiful. your text by, yeah. seeing what the results are at the end and seeing if you get satisfactory results from uh, the, date, the, the set that you're using to yeah. test your, your ideas. 
versus going through several iterations on, on that? As in, or would you continually change your categories? So I think the question is, and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, would you bang your head against the wall over and over again even if it wasn't working? Or do you want to know as soon as possible that it's not working and make a different strategy? Exactly, using the software. Latter. Yeah, no, ours, exactly. we'd much rather stop banging our head against the wall as soon as possible. Sometimes it can be as soon as like five minutes into a labeling. You're like, wait a sec, this is, we just broke the model on item number 10. Okay. So I think it's the latter. Uh, the second part of the question with the crowdsourcing. Um, Items like Amazon's Mechanical Turk, what, how would you assess its usability or accuracy when you just have random people yeah. all over the web who are doing the coding for you? No, I'd say it's very poor based on my experience and there are very smart people who figured out ways to bring out the best of yeah. Turkers as they're known. If you're not familiar with Amazon Turk, it's a, a way, place where you can put your, your data out to be labeled it can end up being a little bit like this, sort of because of the way the remuneration works. There's a, a real emphasis on speed. Uh, so when, we f when I first came to the UMass job from the University of Pittsburgh, I met with the computer science department and their question was, why would I pay your students $13 an hour when I can go to Mechanical Turk and pay a fraction of that for the, the same labeling? And I, my argument then and now is the same, which is it's not the same labeling. Uh, we develop relationships with our annotators. They, they develop trust. Uh, we develop trust in them or lack of trust in them over time. We begin to understand that, for example, the coder who can label everything at a very high degree of accuracy but has never smoked a cigarette or marijuana cannot label the smoking data to save her life. I mean, these are all uh, things that, you know, practical experience would tell you that you, you want to be more discriminating when you assign people to a task depending on the, um, the risk of creating um, false positives and false negatives in your training set. Thank you, Doc. Thank you. Good questions. I knew it was going to come back to this side. Um, so my question is, okay, so once you have everything labeled and, and you, know, you have this, this rich set of labeled data, how do you actually draw the insight? How do you actually now say, okay, uh, I know something and I'm going to change something as a result. So in traditional qualitative research, um, you accumulate these chunks of text and they might just be, again, when it's pen and paper, a, a matter of going back through and starting to write out by hand the memos that when you review those chunks of text. Now one of the criticisms of qualitative research has often been that the researcher will cherry pick the best chunks of text to prove a point that they're intent uh, on proving, and so there, um, you know, there there are many ways to deal with that. I don't think we've really time to deal with all the, the permutations of it, but um, I would just say that uh, caution, uh, err on the side of um, skepticism about your claims, right? I mean, what I do, I I, I try to to build a model. Right? implement the model, understand the strengths and weaknesses of the model, and then if there's something I'm trying to say about the labeled text, it goes back to that more traditional interpretive role. Right? There, you don't lose, not only do we keep the human in the loop, in the end the human has to say what it all means, has to define some value, and the value might be, uh, well, you know, in the central tendencies of the data. Like most of this data is about how difficult it is to get the crop to market, or how difficult it is to know what the price, the best price or the fair price for my crop is. Um, but it may be that having done all this work, the most important things you find are those, those rare, unique comments that even though they are rare within one in a hundred or one in a thousand or one in a million, they're still inherently valuable because of what that one chunk of text teaches you. And so I think you can go to medium data you can go to machine learning. You can go to coding and searching and filtering and all these techniques that software enable and still go back to the place where the human has to say why it matters. And that's an inescapable role for the human, and I believe in it. Um, can I ask a follow-up? Of course. Uh, is there a way to know when it's the extreme outlier versus the central tendency? It's kind of like that answer to how do you know pornography when you see it? it yeah. you, know, you know, can know it when you see it. There's not a, or similar to the answer, like how much data do I need to label before I 
can turn it over to the machines. It really depends on, on so many factors. So like if I had a sample of 100 tweets pulled out of a million, would I know an outlier at the end of 100? I might, but I might have to look at another 100 or another 500 or 1,000 before I really know the landscape of that data. That's one of the real values of a random sampling tool. I used to sort of dream about having, because we used to use all these convoluted methods to create random samples with text data, and now I just built a tool where I can just pull a random sample or uh, pull out of duplicate groups one item when I've got lots of duplicates, just to pull the one item out of every different methods of purposive sampling. These are all things that allow you to reach that point um, where you know what an outlier is and where you know what a central tendency is. I mean, one of the terms I didn't use that I probably should have that's fundamental to qualitative research is this idea of saturation, right? I don't know how many of you have heard of saturation in qualitative research. Saturation is basically you've seen enough of the data that seeing more data won't cause you to have a new insight, right? So if you can shorten the time that it takes to get to saturation, I think you've done something right. And then part, all of these tools are ways that you can do that. You can, you can take what is, what seems like an overwhelming task and break it down into a smaller, more manageable task. And within that smaller and more manageable task, reach saturation more quickly. Thank you. You're welcome. Other questions for Dr. Schulman? One more? I was waiting for. Yeah. I know. I thought we were yeah. going. I was looking at you myself. Tell someone else. Um, so no, thanks a lot for covering. You know this entire spectrum of uh, you know how it has evolved and what actually means um, for qualitative researchers. Um, but moving forward, I know you spoke about your aversion to using the term big data. I understand. You know, I completely understand what you mean. Um, and frankly, even I throw it around every now and then saying, look, you know, I have 50,000 data points, big data, so of course. But what does it actually mean for us moving forward when we talk about, as you said, a billion data points that you have in your database? Probably will be in the future, we'll be using a billion data points for, or billion pieces of text for maybe one research project. Who knows, with increased computing power, I don't know. Perhaps we will. Um, I won't speculate, but probably we will. So, what would it mean? Would it? Would it? Would 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 the approaches that you just said would they still be relevant? Would they still hold? Would. W what do we as researchers have to be ready with? You know, what do we have to be armed with to really yeah. use what is out there? So, um, I have a billion records in my in my database. My software is not designed to deal with a billion records. You know, uh, I sell access to historical Twitter data as part of my business. The more tweets, the more days people buy, the more money potentially I make. So people come to me and then they put in their estimates and they, they figure, oh, this is gonna cost a lot of money. And, and I'm saying, well, why do you need every mention of Obama for eight years? Yeah, that's a massive query in the cloud against trillions upon trillions of cells. So I'm constantly telling people to scale back their research design because honestly, if you want to study President Obama on Twitter, for example, you don't need a billion or even a million records. Mm -hmm. There's going to be very little gained uh, beyond, depending on what you're doing. Yeah. Now, there are certain things where this is not true, but depending on what you're doing, especially if it's qualitative or interpretive or uh, sort of a text analytics style approach, the difference between having 100,000 and a million or 100,000 and 2 million, really the second 100,000 doesn't get you a whole lot of things the first 100,000 didn't. So I'm constantly telling people bigger is not better, even though it's in my economic interest, to say, yeah, you need eight years and every mention and you don't want to miss a single tweet. It's just not true, <laughs> except in some cases. Like if you're studying a particular campaign at a particular point in time, maybe then you need an exhaustive data set. Uh, but Typically, people want more than they need, and they think more is better, and that's a thing for which I think, uh, particularly in this field, evaluation, it would be you'd be hard pressed to to talk about, except for, again a number of different you know other statistical or modeling or unsupervised or network mapping approaches. It's hard to make the case for a billion records.
Thanks. Yes. Thank you. I'm Caroline Heider. I'm the uh, head of the Independent Evaluation Group at the World Bank Group. Thank you very much for your presentation. I saw myself in that presentation. I Good. belong to that group of evaluators who started out coding manually and doing all of that work. Then uh, I helped a friend use Nudist. Okay. Uh, and so when you put that up, I said, like, oh, I recognize that. We should start a support group, I think. <laughs> <laughs> a psychological support group. Um, <laughs> And my colleagues now are using, some of them are using in vivo. So, uh, you know, I, I really relate to this because we do deal with a lot of text uh, that needs to be analyzed in a systematic way and efficiently because if you have thousands and thousands of documents, sure. it's, it's a lot of text. So maybe to turn all of this into a question, what, what does your typical clientele look like? Do you have evaluators who come to you and say like, well, can you help us sort of dig through all of these documents to, to make sense out of them? Or is it other clientele? For example, I mean, the people looking for Obama tweets, I would imagine are not necessarily evaluators. No, and in fact, I, there, I believe there are some evaluators amongst our user base uh, but they haven't worked directly with me. So the, the folks I have most direct contact with are government agencies sorting public comments. That was the original reason we got into doing research on, on software. So anytime an agency proposes a rule or a change, the public can comment and we deal with a lot of those. We have dealt with um, HR departments who have um, large organizations where they have survey data, where the survey responses number 10,000, 50,000, 100,000. We had one organization had 400,000 responses to their global employee survey. Uh, and for things like that, being able to sort of quickly pull out everything that's, you know, about benefits, everything there, are, you know, you can build keyword lists of, of things that have to be investigated by the legal department. There are all sorts of ways that what we do now kind of overlaps with e-discovery, where you have a mandate to pull out within that larger collection every, you know, mention of harassment, every mention of abuse or things like that. And you can actually, uh, really um, develop a reusable approach. And that's where I think the, the tr true value comes out of software like this is if every project you do is different, machine learning is really not what you need. Right? But if there is some repetition of the core th central tendencies in the data, um, then you can build these very simple models that will accelerate the point of pulling out all those things that you need to get when you're doing your quarterly surveys or your annual surveys or whatever the data source might be. And then uh, the biggest number of users of our software are academics. They're doing research across the disciplines. You'd be amazed what disciplines are studying what goes on on Twitter these days. Essentially, Twitter has become somewhat um, analogous to a 300 million person sensor system uh, where that is deployed globally and creating reports that um, are faster at reporting earthquakes than, than seismic detectors and a whole range of other things, disasters, attacks, things like uh, horrible things that are happening in the world these days usually show up on Twitter before they show up on the police scanner. So unfortunately that is the, we've run out of time and so I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Schulman very much for a fascinating talk and um, I think we're ready to come back to the plenary. Thank you.